Okay, so we are going to talk about chapter 9, which is the x-ray tube, and I want to spend an entire class session just talking about the x-ray tube, to separate it out from the x-ray circuit or x-ray production and just really look at all the working parts to uh, this machinery. Here's some objectives for us. We will talk about generally how these tubes are designed. Um, we'll talk about the specific components around the housing of the x-ray tube, so the glass envelope and the, the lead housing around the x-ray tube. We'll talk about um, the cathode part uh, and filament currents that are supplied to the cathode from the x-ray circuit. Um, we'll talk about the rotating anode and we'll, we'll look at the, all the particular parts of the rotate anode or four general parts to it. Um, we will talk about line focus and I will introduce heel effect. We will later on spend more time talking about heel effect, but um, that's something that's not in our textbook, but we should go ahead and start talking about it. Um, and then we will talk about um, the tube rating chart, so heat, heat units, because these things primarily, um, in the past, and maybe I'll do this next week, um, I used to bring in a toaster and make toast when I was talking about the x-ray tube because that's very similar to what's happening when we, that is thermionic emission, what's happening inside of a, a toaster. It is not happening at the heat or the intensity that happens inside the x-ray tube, but um, making toast is very similar to making x-rays. So these things are primarily, well, I guess what I'm saying is these things are primarily heat producers. Something like 99% of the energy produced by an x-ray tube is heat energy, okay? So they're fairly inefficient um, machines in terms of x-ray production. So here is um, the illustration of the x-ray tube that I used on your test, right? Um, and we will uh, be coming back to this illustration uh, but um, as a general overview, um, I'll just kind of walk you through these different parts. And I think maybe I'll start here um, with the anode. So let me, so here's the anode right here. Um, it is made out of tungsten. Tungsten has a very, very high melting point. It has a high Z number, which is helpful because what we're trying to do is we're trying to give the electrons that we're producing with the cathode, something that's very, very dense for them to collide into. So that high Z number is helpful because that's speaking to how dense <coughs> the material is. Um, now related to that, you'll notice that we have uh, a separate uh, material, uh, molybdenum, or I think that's how you say it, um, molly, right, uh, neck, and... <laughs> Um, internal portion of the base, right? Why do we do that? Well, it is more lightweight, and yet it still has a very high heat unit, right? So it allows us to rotate this anode at high speeds um, with a decreased amount of energy, okay, in terms of the actual mechanical energy required to rotate this thing. Um, Continuing, though, in this clockwise direction, we have an envelope, right? And that is typically made out of glass, right? So on both this fixed anode tube and this uh, Coolidge rotating anode tube, they both have glass envelopes. And the reason for that is we need to produce a vacuum for the area where x-ray production is, is occurring. Okay? Uh, Pyrex glass, right? Yeah. Pyrex, yeah. Um, or uh, uh, corning wear, that kind of stuff. Something with, again, with a, with a fairly high heat rating that's fairly indestructible. Um, there, here we've indicated the filament circuit, and so this is the negatively charged portion of the tube, right? Um, feeding into our filament. And around the filament, it's not indicated on this drawing, but this portion right here is a focusing cup. And uh, this um, is also uh, negatively charged, 
And so it forces the electrons back towards the filament. As thermionic emission is occurring and the electrons are being boiled off from the filament, this focusing cup is pushing them back towards the filament. So they're not straying out into somewhere else in the vacuum. Because what would happen is, say we had an electron that strayed out to here before we energized the anode, it might hit somewhere else on the anode and produce what we would call off-focus radiation. Okay, are you tracking with me? So we want that focusing cup to be negatively charged in order to push the electrons back towards that um, filament. When we energize the um, anode, though, with enough potential energy, with a kilovoltage of potential energy, um, the electrons are going to jump um, and be accelerated close to the speed of light in the space of like an inch or so. You can see the distance up here in these tubes, how quickly they are accelerated. Um, and so that is an electron beam that is accelerated from the cathode to collide into the anode. It's an electron beam. So we're talking about in a single second, trillions of electrons colliding with the anode. So a whole lot of x-rays are being produced. The majority of the x-rays that are produced um, are going to run into the housing itself, probably. Um, because when x-rays are produced, they're produced isotropically. That means in all directions at the same time. So we will have x-rays that are shooting up and to the side and every which way. <coughs> Um, at this production point. It's almost like if you can imagine an atomic bomb going off inside this tube, the energy is going out in all directions. Right? So that's why we have this heavy, heavy lead housing around the x-ray tube itself to protect us when we energize this thing from, again, any x-rays that are being produced in a direction other than what we want. Right? Um, but the x-ray beam will exit through a window here. And it's generally made out of aluminum. We can't see it on this part here, but in this area right here, there would be an aluminum window in the housing itself that would permit the, the x-rays to exit the tube. Um, and they would go then in directly into the collimator. So we'll, we'll look at collimators at a different day, but... Right now, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on this. Then again, there's that difficult to pronounce molybdenum. How do you say it? Molybdenum. Molybdenum. That is probably right. I have always just called it molybdenum. Molybdenum something. Molly. Uh neck and base of the anode, and then we'll look at this section um, as its own contained system. So this is on the anode side, and it has, um, a, the large parts of it are the stator and the rotor. So this is a rotor, this is a stator, and what it does is it produces electromagnetic pulses, and it causes this rotor to rotate, right? Now that's really, really important to know. And if you look, um, we can't actually see it here. Um, but this, as I mentioned again, is a glass envelope covering this entire tube, right? So there is no mechanical connection between this and that. So we are causing movement to occur through glass. Right? There's not a mechanical connection between this part and the rotating part. So what we're doing is we're using electromagnetic pulses to pulse through the glass and cause the rotor to rotate. Okay, so this is an electromagnetic engine. And so the, I, the way I remember that is the armature is the section of it that holds the rotor. The rotor has bearings inside of it, but no grease. There's no grease or anything like that, because we wouldn't want grease to get free of these bearings and contaminate the, uh, the tube. But the stator 
it stays there. The stator stays there outside the x-ray tube. The rotor rotates. It moves, and so it's directly connected to that anode, causing rotation. Can you say what you said about the armature? The armature is going to contain the engine. So if you, if you look, it's pretty clearly demonstrated here. All these copper wirings and stuff, we would call this like the armature, right? Um, so the armature contains both the stator and the rotor, right? It's, it's a portion that kind of supports it, right? And so the, the rotor is going to rotate against that armature, right? Let me, let me rewind really quickly. The stator is not connected to the armature, so I'm sorry for any confusion there. The armature is connected to the rotor, and it's what the rotor is rotating against, Okay. The armature is connected to the rotor, and it's what the rotor is rotating against. The stator is a separate thing. It is outside that glass envelope and is producing the electromagnetic pulses that's causing the rotor to rotate against the armature. So, around the x-ray tube, and one of the reasons I provided this slide is because it's helpful for us to also think about the entire system at this point. This tube doesn't like just exist um, without a whole lot of support. So there's going to be some kind of support system, either a floor type support system, which is what we have in both the x-ray rooms that we have uh, here on campus, or a ceiling support system, which is the majority of what y'all work with at the clinical site, um, or it could be a C-arm type mobile support system um, that we can wheel around. Um, in addition to that, it will have protective housing around it. That protective housing has two purposes. Number one, it is to protect the tube itself, and it's also to protect us from the x-rays. So it is generally made out of lead, and it is the main reason why these tubes are so heavy, is the protective housing around the x-ray tube, is that lead housing. Um, then there will be some kind of enclosure, generally like we mentioned, it's made out of glass or Pyrex. There may be portions of it that are made out of aluminum or some kind of low Z metal. Um, and that enclosure, the primary purpose of the enclosure is to provide a vacuum. Okay. Internal to that enclosure is the cathode, like we mentioned, the negatively charged portion with the filaments and the focusing cup on that side, and then opposite that a rotating anode. There are um, applications for stationary anodes. They are largely in dentistry. So when they take a dental x-ray, it is much quieter than a diagnostic x-ray machine because no part of it is rotating. It is just a stationary x-ray tube, a stationary anode, I should say. Um, so their, their machines are a little bit quieter than ours because they're not using a rotating anode. And the main reason for that, of course, is cost. Um, if you can imagine causing this thing to rotate inside of, an a, inside of a, a vacuum was a, was a feat of engineering in itself, in every single x-ray tube that we make, um, with the specifications required by the government, it's fairly expensive to make, versus having something that's just a, a, just a fixed point inside the, inside the vacuum tube. So the pr protective housing is going to protect against excessive radiation and electric shock. It reduces leakage radiation to less than one uh, milligray per hour at a meter when operated at max conditions. So that's tested every year. Um, <coughs> this is not a number that you necessarily need to memorize right now, but you'll need to memorize it by the time you exit the program because you'll probably have at least one registry question related to this. We will return to it in radiation biology. But that is the measure of how well the x-ray tube is protecting us, that protective housing. is Does it prevent that leakage radiation from that isotropic um, reaction that's occurring in the anode? Um, does it stop those x-rays from exiting um, the protective housing and contaminating or causing us to be irradiated?
Then within that, the Coolidge X-ray tube has a vacuum, generally constructed out of glass. And that is housed within a glass envelope. So think about it like a light bulb. It's the same idea. It has an envelope around, a glass envelope around the light bulb. On the cathode side, we've said that that consists of the filament, the focusing cup, and any associated wiring that's coming then from the step-down transformer. Okay? So the step-down transformer powers that, um, that cathode to begin thermionic emission. That means it's, it starts to produce heat. And in the production of heat, it starts boiling off electrons and producing a space charge effect. Okay? So that's very, very important. Um, so it is actually helpful for us to rotor for a moment, and it's not so much that we get the anode up to speed. It is more that the cathode can have boiled off sufficient amounts of electrons to make the exposure. Because the, we want those electrons just floating around in the focusing cup so that when I energize the anode, it's not like they're being pulled out of that wire. They're just floating around in space. They're ready to jump, right? Um, so that space charge effect is what occurs around those filament wires as they boil off electrons. They start to produce an increasing amount of electrical negative charge there on that cathode side. So they're that much more ready to jump They've got all these electrons around each other. They're ready to go. So the minute that I energize that anode, they are propelled towards it. Um, that is the primary reason why these extra tubes make so much heat. And I should stress that the filament wire is also made out of tungsten. The filament wire is made out of tungsten as well. And that, again, is because it has to be able to withstand a tremendous amount of heat. So it talks about the space charge effect on page 147. The negative charge of the focusing cup in the, an illustration of the focusing cup with different filament sizes is found on page 149. And that illustration of the space charge effect is found on 148, kind of a cloud of electrons that's formed around the filament. He, has, he says on page 149 that only 0.5% of the radiation emitted um, is in the form of useful diagnostic x-rays. Um, the other 99.5% is emitted from the x-ray tube and it's housing in the form of wasted heat. Um, the numbers that I memorized when I was in school was 1% x-rays, 99% heat, but something in that range in year five. That is something you would expect to see on a, on a test at some point, right? And that's found on page 149. But the, primarily this thing is a giant space heater. So I will um, pause here to talk a little bit about the different focal spot sizes, um, the different filament sizes. So we can see on page 149 there's, there's two different focusing cups for two different filaments, a smaller one and a larger one. The smaller one is generally reserved for uh, a smaller amount of radiation exposure, so a lesser MA, a lesser mass is going to be used on the smaller focal spot, and it will provide us with increased spatial resolution. It's going to improve the sharpness of the image to use a smaller focal spot smaller filament size. Um, the larger filament size can withstand a higher heat unit. It can boil off more electrons because it's just bigger in size without burning out. So we will use it anytime we need to have a bigger mass. We'll want to make sure that we've selected the large focal spot size. That is true with both the labs that we use for the most part, in your clinical site, the machines are probably automatically switching out based on what exam you're doing. Okay.
Um, and it says uh, standard size for these focal spots is generally about um, 0.5. Um, uh, I don't know if that's correct. It says 0.5. I think the units are wrong, but it's 0.5 centimeter for the small focal spot and uh, one centimeter for the large focal spot. That's not necessarily going to be on a test, but that's something to, to know about their size. We're not talking about, even when we're talking about the large focal spot size, we're not talking about a huge thing. We're talking about something about the size of a centimeter. Okay? And he indicates that the electrons accelerate to more than one half the speed of light, somewhere in the range of one half the speed of light to speed of light, depending on how efficient the x-rays are being produced. They're going very fast, is the point. Now, I want to indicate that when we're talking about the electrons, right, the electrons that are being boiled off by the cathode, they are actual particles, right? They're particles that are being freed from that tungsten atom by heat. They're little tiny particles, right? So they are not x-rays at that point. They are an electron beam. They are particulate radiation. So there's going to be specific types of interactions that occur inside the x-ray tube related to the fact that it is electrons in a vacuum that are having those interactions. And then there's going to be different types of interactions that occur outside the x-ray tube, like in the patient's body. And those are photon, those are x-ray interactions with the patient's body. There's no electrons involved. There's not electrons leaving the x-ray tube. Everything, all the energy that's leaving the x-ray tube is either heat or x-ray. No electrons. So we are not seeing electron interactions inside the patient. That's not part of how diagnostic x-ray works. Are you tracking with me? That was something that, for me as an x-ray tech student, I was like in the program for a year before the light bulb went off, and I realized, oh, okay, that's why Bremsstrahlung doesn't happen inside the patient, because Bremsstrahlung requires electrons. And I'm not making electrons exit the x-ray tube. I'm just making x-rays x-ray exit the x-ray tube. So um, there is a so sometimes they'll talk about tungsten impregnated thorium, maybe a portion of what's inside the filament. I think about it being um, tungsten wire primarily, the thorium part, you know, if you want the bonus points, remember that there's thorium in there. Um, the big takeaway here is that it has an extremely high melting point. The melting point for tungsten is 6,200 degrees Fahrenheit. 6,200 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Um, and we can... Uh, we can kind of bump up the uh, the melting point a little bit by adding a, and, add, and add a little bit increased efficiency by adding the thorium. So when we energize the X-ray tube circuit, we're going to step down. We're going to use that MA selector to use a step-down transformer, right, to create an increased amount of current, right? So we're stepping down the potential, but we're stepping up the current, and then we are going to use a little tiny wire, right? And that literally produces more friction for the electrons. So when the, when the electrons hit, as they're moving through the circuit, and they hit that little tiny wire, there's enough friction that electrons get hot. They get mad about how much friction there is there. And that's why they start to boil off electrons. They're trying to power their way through this filament, right? And since they can't get through, they start to get hot. They start to get heated. So I mentioned that there is a focusing cup. It's going to be a shallow depression. Um, and it's uh, designed to house those filaments. And it's going to focus the electrons that are being kicked out from the filament, producing that space charge effect.
So, um, as the electrons build up in the area around the filament, their negative charge begins to oppose the emission of additional electrons, right? So there's a cloud now of electrons, right? And there's enough of negative charge there that it's almost as though I can't boil off any more electrons, right? That would definitely be the case. So this is giving us two things, right? Number one, there's a reason from a physics point of view to, to think about the small versus the large focal spot because that large filament is going to be able to boil off more electrons. There's just physically more space for it to produce those electrons and have that cloud out over a centimeter area versus a half a centimeter area, right? Um, the other thing about this that is worth thinking about um, is uh, we could reach a point where we are saturated, right? Where the, the filament is no longer boiling off any additional electrons. It is just producing more heat now um, because there is enough of a space charge there that um, it's forcing the stuff um, into the uh, back into the, the filament wire. Um, when when we talk about saturation, though, another thing to think about is saturation in the other direction. So as they jump, as that electron beam jumps from the cathode to the anode, right? Um, we want a, uh, as, as the KVP increases, as that potential energy increases, more and more electrons are going to want to make that jump. They're that much more attracted to the anode. And it's the same way with magnets, right? As we turn up magnetic power, there's more and more potential that something's going to jump across the room and smack into that magnet. It's the exact same um, potential difference. So basically at KVP and at higher KVP energies, the X-ray tube is more efficient. So one big takeaway with that is that as we increase the KVP, we're increasing the tube's efficiency at producing X-rays. So um, the anode side, the positive side of this thing, it consists of the anode stator and rotor, the anode of course, attracts electrons from the cathode side, um, and the rest of it allows for rotation, which allows it to cool, to distribute the heat across the entire surface. So, generally, um, there is a tract around the anode that is the tungsten portion, um, and that tract is within the molybdenum or molybdenum <laughs> or just molly it is within this other um, material right we like the tungsten again because it has a high melting point and a high Z number that so that high atomic number or that high Z number is our friend in this case um, because we want the electrons to be able to smash into something And so we'll sometimes call that the focal tract, right? There are separate focal tracts um, for uh, the large filament from, and the small filament. They will have a slightly different angle and a slightly different size. But that is the part that has imparted a positive charge in order to attract, attract the electrons toward it. Um, the molybdenum and the graphite have a lower mass density and they while at the same time still maintaining a high melting point. And again, the purpose here is to allow us to spin this thing at very fast speeds. If the entire thing was made out of tungsten, it would be that much more difficult to spin. And uh, spreading out the heat over the surface of the anode gives us much higher temperatures for the tube. So by using a rotating anode,
the heat units it can withstand is roughly a thousand times the heat units that a stationary tube can withstand. That's on page 153 in our textbook. Um, and it's spinning at about 10,000 rotations per minute. So it's spinning very, very quickly. Um, I don't know if anyone, I should, I should bring in an angle grinder or something. Has, has anyone ever used an angle grinder? Scary power tool to use, right? Those things spin at roughly 3,000 rotations per minute. Like a good DeWalt angle grinder spins at about 3,000 rotations per minute. The anode is spinning at 10,000 rotations per minute. So I'll bring in, maybe I'll bring in an angle grinder next week. We can all get freaked out by how quickly this thing is spinning. Okay? The target is the place, the actual place where the electrons interact with the anode and produce um, tungsten. Ignore this uh, page number here. It is generally made out of tungsten. Wait a minute, you said produce tungsten? It produce x-rays, I'm sorry. Okay. Produce x-rays. Um, so it is made out of tungsten. It is the place where the electrons produce x-rays. So their electrons kind of turn into x-rays at this point. Um, it is generally made out of tungsten. There are some really fancy x-ray machines where it may be made out of gold because um, gold also has a very high Z number, um, but generally is made out of tungsten. So, here is some of the specs on tungsten. It has that high atomic number of 74, which permits X-ray emission. It has a high melting point um, of 60, roughly 61, uh, 6200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it's not going to melt very easily, but we can still damage it by, by not using this machine correctly. Okay? So we're going to talk some about that. And once it is heated up, it also has the ability to give off heat very rapidly. Right? Um, so it helps it to cool that much more quickly. This is especially important in CT, where we're using even higher heat units to produce x-rays. Here's an image of a failure in tungsten. Um, so if the anode is not spinning as, as rapidly as it needs to, if it's not achieving that um, 10,000 rotations per minute, if it's spinning a little bit too slowly, and the electrons are bombarding it too thickly in a single area, we start to get pitting, and we can even crack the anode, or we can start to vaporize the tungsten, right? Vaporizing tungsten, as you can imagine, requires a tremendous amount of heat to turn this, to not just melt it, to produce a vapor out of it, right? That, those kinds of things do happen inside of the x-ray tube. In fact, that's the number one cause of x-ray tube failure, right? So not so much pitting or cracking the anode as vaporization of tungsten, and then the tungsten starts to coat um, the outside surface of the glass envelope, so now we have tungsten all kind of around the inside of the envelope. And so we would produce a more off-focus or electron arcing um, within the x-ray tube. And I want to see... Uh, if it says anything about... The electron arcing, what page is that on? So it has the speeds for spinning the uh, anode on page 153, and the. It does not talk about tube arcing here. Well, okay. Thank you. Yeah, it so it talks about uh, filament and anode vaporization. Um, and so we can have wear, wear with the bearings, right? But the, m the major problem that we're going to have is uh, pitting of the anode, which is what I illustrated with that slide, which results in uh, tungsten vaporization.
and then we start to see arcing, um, which is almost like a little electrical storms inside the x-ray tube. So we have an induction motor, which is causing this anode to rotate. And so, like I said, again, this support assembly here we'll call the armature, right? There's a stator, which is an electromagnetic. It just stays there outside the glass envelope. So it's outside the glass envelope. And then a rotating portion, the rotor, right? So again, it emphasizes that the glass envelope is outside of the rotor. So the rotor's inside the glass envelope. The stator has these little electromagnetic coils that are pulsing and causing the rotor to rotate inside of the glass envelope. So that is an induction motor, an electromagnetic motor. So, um, to talk just a little bit more about the target, um, it has an actual focal spot, um, which is the physical area that the electrons are hitting. That's part of a focal tract, so I'll draw this out here. And then we have an effective focal spot. This is a really important key concept here. So I'm going to draw it a few different ways. So the focal tract, if we were to look at the, um, if we were to look at the anode from the direction that the electrons see, right before they smash into it, right, it would look like a giant disc. And on this disc, there would be a portion of it, like this right here. Sorry, and this portion here is the focal tract, right. The actual part that the electrons are going to collide with, we would call the focal spot. That's the actual physical focal spot on the anode. It's this little tiny area where we want the electrons to collide. Right? And electrons are lazy, so they're going to pick the shortest distance from the cathode to the anode. Right? The anode is that little blue circle? Yeah, that's the little blue circle is indicating the actual focal spot and the focal tract is indicated in red. Okay. Now I'm going to need to turn the anode to where you're looking at it from the side like this to indicate how the effective focal spot works. Okay. So from the side the anode looks a little bit different, right? It looks more like that from the side. And at this, at this side juncture, we've got the, the tract running around it like that. And that actual focal spot now is right in here, right? Now what happens, since we have it on this angle, is an interesting little geometrical thing happens, okay? So we've got a fairly large electron beam that's attracted to this area, and, uh, and let me see if our textbook illustrates this better than I may be able to draw it. It might not. I'm going to uh, move this up just a little bit, so bear with me here. So when we train that beam on it, right, that's fairly large, we use that angle to focus it down. And so now we are producing what we call an effective focal spot which is the projected area. So from this very large area, a very small thing is focused down. So we're using just the tilt of the anode to geometrically decrease the area where the x-rays are, are directed. Okay? Is that making sense? Okay. Let me pause this. So here it is illustrated a little bit more clearly, maybe. So we have this target angle, right, here. And we have a focal tract that's energized. That electron beam hits the focal tract, and the, the extras that are produced in this direction have been narrowed down considerably. So that is, again, the line focus principle, principle 
which produces an effective focal spot that's smaller than the actual focal spot. Right? So if I was to, I'd put um, effective, right, less than actual. And we call that the line focus principle. So the results, it results in an effective focal spot size much smaller than the actual focal spot size. So that, originally, let's say that's, that filament was a half centimeter or one centimeter, something like that. Focal spot's going to be much, much smaller in millimeters now. The effective focal spot's going to be in millimeters. Generally, we have... Um, dual focal spots on the anode to match with those dual filament sizes. Um, so there'll be uh, maybe a, a decreased degree here to cause this that much smaller of a focal spot here for the small filament versus a 12 degree angle there um, for the larger focal spot. Those are the fancy ones. Okay, our textbook doesn't talk about this, but it's coming, so we might as well mention it. I am with Mr. Wolf. I don't think that anode heel effect is as big a deal as historically programs like X-ray tech programs have made out of it, but it's something to think about. So I've just told you that we have to put an angulation on the anode, right? And as the electrons are, ran, are colliding into this thing, they're producing x-rays in all possible directions. Does anyone remember the fancy net word for that? Isotropically. Good. So, the x, only the x-rays that exit in this direction along the central ray are helpful to me. But what happens with this anode heel effect is that on the anode side of the x-ray tube, there is an increased, the, the energy is decreasing, right? So there's an increased percentage of the x-rays that are being absorbed by the anode itself. The anode is gobbling up some of these x-rays, right? They would have been helpful, but when they were produced, like let's say that was one was produced right here, well, it had to travel through all this tungsten, right? just to get out of the anode, versus this guy here, let's say he's produced right here and he just goes straight down, right? Or this one here, it gets produced this way and he goes that way. So on the cathode side, we are going to have an increased amount of percentage of intensity on the cathode side because there's not anode to crash into over here. Versus on the anode side, there's anode to crash into, so we're going to see a fall off of intensity. Now, in general, we're not shooting anything out this wide, right? So the actual amount of play is like 90% to 105. Not that big of a deal, right? Um, but this would be a potential problem if we start to increase our SIDs much further than what we standardly use, right? So it's something to be aware of. It's out there, the anode heel effect. Um, it is the electrons, once they produce the x-rays, the x-rays themselves may interact with the anode and reduce the amount of intensity on the anode side. So, the heel effect results in a smaller effective focal spot size and less radiation intensity on the anode side of the x-ray beam. So, a max technique should never be applied to a cold tube. When we get into image evaluation, anytime that we're doing experiments in the lab, we will warm up the x-ray tube prior to doing some of these fairly large ex uh, exposures that we'll make. And I think there's been some of y'all who've been in the lab and we we're going to make like a KUV exposure and I said, you know what, wait a minute, let's pull the IR and let's warm the x-ray tube up before making this exposure. This is the reason why I don't have 
$100,000 sitting around inside my house to buy a new x-ray tube. So why well, I might as well just spend some time warming this thing up before um, I go and make x-rays with it. Um, this is, uh, so um, when we apply a, when we don't heat up the tube and we apply a max technique to a cold, tech, cold anode, we're that much more likely to increase uh, tungsten vaporization, which uh, in, uh, can cause electron arcing, right? So we have heat rating charts. And a lot of these have, again, been absorbed into the software. But it used to be that with some of these older machines, like the Continental machine in there, I used to have to check my technique against the heat rating chart for certain exposures, like for hips and things like that. Um, I would want to make sure that I didn't exceed the heat units that the tube is rated for. So the way that this chart works is you look at what MA you've set and what KVP you've set. And let's say that I've set a, uh, a KVP. I want to do this chest x-ray, right? So I'm going to set a KVP of 100, right? And, uh, and I, I, want to keep my, um, I want to keep my patient movement down as much as possible. So I want this MA as high as possible, right? Because the higher my MA is, the lower my exposure time can be. Right? So, but I've just, by setting that 100, I've already said, well, I can't do that. I can't do 200 MA. I can't do 250 MA. So, what's the max technique I can get? Well, it looks like 150 with an exposure time of maybe 0.4. It's going to be pushing it. Right? So, I multiply 100 times 0.4. That comes out to 40. That's plenty of room for me. All right, so I can set a technique, any reasonable chest x-ray I can set at the 150 MA station and then dial in my mass from there, okay? So I, it's just a matter of tracing the lines over, so I would say 100, okay, what's the max that I can use? Oh, point, it looks like about a 0.4, right about here, right? So the actual mass setting, the maximum mass, like let's how would I calculate the mass? Mass times KVP times second. Well, it would be MA, MA times time in, the se in seconds. And this is indicated in seconds. So 100 times 0.4, 40 mass. Are you tracking with me? It's 100 MA. I'm sorry. I lied. 150 right here. 150 MA, I apologize, I just confused myself. 150 MA times that 0.4, 0.4. The max it can do is closer to 60, okay? So how do you, how do you know your max? The max? Yeah. Um, I'm saying that um, if I set a certain KVP, that's going to be one of my variables. The other one here is going to be time at various MA stations, right? So just by setting this 100 kVp, I know that I can't use the 200 or the 250 MA station. Because it's lower than 100. Yeah, because it's this line is over those. So the safe area is anything underneath the red line. Maybe I should say that. The safe area is anything underneath this red line. Okay? Um, so everything underneath this red line, everything underneath 125 is safe. Okay. Right? Everything underneath 150, all this is safe. Right? This stuff out here, anything over the red line, not safe for the tube. This is the stuff that's not safe out here, okay? Um, this is something we should probably have posted, and this differs for every single x-ray tube, and you'll notice it also differs for the focal spot. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Okay, so when you did your blue lines, why did you not go out to where the 100 intersects with the 150? Right. 
because that's absolutely pushing it. And so I was trying to figure out what is the maximum time that I can have at 150, right? Um, I wouldn't want to go past it. You get what I'm saying? I'm saying, but wouldn't the, the 100 line go over even further to the right? So, you want to make sure that the KVP setting and the time of the exposure intersect below the MA reading. Okay? So, let's, um, let's, let's do some experiments here. Who wants to take a stab at this one? All right, and that is the end of the lecture.